show. Tonight, Don's guests include movie star John Hargraves, Kamal, and our special guest, Harry M. Miller. And I'm also in the opening number. And now, here's Don. <laughs> to the show. Tonight, on a Don Lane show, we pay tribute to all those guys that gave us those thrills and spills over the year, the footy players. It's grand final week all over Australia. Everybody's waiting for the grand final from Perth to Melbourne to Sydney to Darwin to Brisbane. So here we go with our tribute to the finalists, the grand finalists in grand final week. Graham, give it to me. Yeah. You gotta be
thank you very much. That was, that was more work than a grand final. <laughs> well, uh, as you probably gathered, it's grand final week. That's all everybody will be talking about for the next five days until, uh, or six days till we get there. Uh, it's the culmination of the footy year. So we thought, what a good opportunity to look back on some of the outrageous comments made by some of our uh, sports commentators. Most of them, of course, in fairness, made during the excitement of the game. But do they make sense? Uh, in Melbourne, Lawrence Money in his column in Black and White in the Herald collects these gems. And then they all vie for his Boot in the Mouth Award. And in Sydney, these gaffes are collected by a guy named Alex Buzo. And you'll see many of them in his book called Tautology II. <laughs> now, here are some examples of the kind of things we're talking about. Clark Hansen on 3LO in Melbourne during the course of a game shouted, Conlon's got the ball. He's played brilliantly since he was set off. <laughs> Rex Mossop, an old friend of mine who seems to be a big target in Sydney, said, people have forgotten just what a fiasco the match of the day ultimately ended up when it was finished with. <laughs> Heavy. Jack Dyer, our old friend Captain Blood on 3KZ in Melbourne, he said, the game was played in four separate quarters. Good going, Jack. <laughs> we really worked that out. Dave Darby, a sports announcer in Adelaide, said they have had the sting taken out of their sails. Uh, work on that. Once again, we're back to Jack Dyer on Channel 7. He said, a lot of good players come down from the ACTU. <laughs> <laughs> Back to Rex Mossop in Sydney, he said, let me recapitulate back to what happened previously. <laughs> and Jack Dyer, of course, wins the entire award with this statement on 3KZ, the last word, a typical Jack Dyer fight. He said, it's so dark here, it's like the black hole of Dakota. <laughs> we'll be back in a moment after we take a break for a commercial, which will only take a moment during the commercial time while we take the break. Thank you very much. Boy, everybody's walking around here in foot football gear. They're feeling really butch, right? They're all sort of hitting balls around and doing things. <laughs> really nice. Uh, most people know the story of Harry M. Miller from his early beginnings in New Zealand to the days of touring some of the biggest names in show business. You name him, he's done it. Judy Garland, Sammy Davis, the Rolling Stones, there was Hair, Jesus Christ Superstar, and much more. He was a friend of politicians and even royalty. Uh, Harry earned his name as the biggest entrepreneur in Australia. Uh, then came the CompuTickets disaster, the court cases, and suddenly Harry M. Miller was a golden boy no longer, and a jail term followed. Uh, pretty heavy stuff for a guy who's gone from a white-collar worker, very successful, into the dregs of uh, going to prison. Harry M. Miller is with us tonight. He probably has a story to tell and a few things to answer, so would you please welcome him. Harry M. Miller, here. <laughs> Welcome out. It's a bit late, but welcome out, as they say. Is that, is that what they say to you? I don't know what they say anymore. Tell me something. Uh, I had a chance to browse through the book. Most of it's biographical. The last two chapters really deal with what would virtually be the last two chapters of your life. Why did you write this, uh, uh, this book? Well, it started about 10 years ago. And um, uh, a man that I collaborated with for years, Dennis O'Brien, mm. um, we started to get the book together. And about three years ago, uh, the Macmillan Company asked us if, if I'd finally do the book. So I said yes. So we started work. And uh, finally, we ended up with a couple of chapters. Didn't plan it, actually, that there were a couple of extra chapters in it. It was just going to be a biography. You yeah, mean. it was just so, a biography yeah. about, yeah. you know, from starting out in New Zealand and all through those quite incredible days in the theatre and what really happened in the Royal Muse and what the horses really did when I tried to get the good coach and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and the sad thing that happened right here in Melbourne with Judy Garland and all those things. And then came the Compu Ticket crash and then came a quite bloody dreadful period um, in jail. And that's when I finished the book. I said at the end, uh, it's time to go back to work. Mm. 
Harry, there's many pros and cons about CompuTicket, okay? So I really don't even want to enter it because I think the, at least according to what I've read in there, the ins and the out and the whys and the wherefores of CompuTicket is quite confusing to a layman like myself. There's a lot of uh, political things in there. There's a lot of uh, legal wrangling going on with everybody. But let's talk about prison. I mean, that's got to be the biggest cultural shock of anyone's life, to be removed from your everyday way of life, from a successful career, and, and thrown in there. So, yeah, there, there were some things that didn't worry me at all. Um, as I say in the book, I ran away to sea when I was, you know, mm. 17. So being in a small room didn't worry me. In fact, because it wasn't at sea and I wasn't being ill all the time, it was you know, a bit of a relief. Um, uh, I went to boarding school for 10 or 12 years and at boarding school in, in New Zealand, they give out prizes for bad food every year. So <laughs> jail food wasn't a problem. What, what appalled me, um, and it would appall most people who are watching this program, people in the audience, was that um, I, I couldn't believe what I saw. Um, on the first day that I was incarcerated, um, I saw two young guys shooting heroin into their arms in, a, in an open lavatory, in an open yard. Mm. Uh, my mouth just flew open. And I, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that put hair on. So at a time when people thought that grass was something that you mowed on a Saturday morning. Right. You've changed uh, your attitudes on grass because of that too. Well, of course, and, and I, I was just appalled. <laughs> um, what happened uh, was that I, I looked at these kids and over that 10 months I talked to lots of these young kids and there are parents here and watching the show who probably think their kids are at a drive-in movie tonight, but in fact they're out robbing, stealing, maybe with guns, to get some more money, yeah. more than they need in their job. Uh, to f handle their drug habit. And I, I just think that it's a real worry. And one of the things that I was concerned about in that quite awful time was that I never heard anybody really talk about human beings. I never heard anybody talk about families. I never heard anybody talk about dignity or rehabilitation. And the system's no good, you know? Most young kids today know it. Um, if the system worked, people wouldn't keep going back to jail. And I know that... Uh, from my point of view, and I'm very right-wing politically, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm even to the right of Jay because I'm from the rural realm. But when I, when I think about these young kids, I worry because if I, I think now that there's no doubt in my mind that I would decriminalise marijuana in this country, in fact, everywhere in the world, because it's that track that leads it's to It's that starting drugs. point, and when it's not there, they you move know, on to something else. What you yeah, mean. a lot of people who, who, yeah. who smoke grass who don't go on to hard drugs. But I never met anybody that was on heroin, that was an addict in jail, mm. um, that didn't start with grass. And some dealer didn't say, haven't got any grass today, mate. Mm. Just try this. No extra cost. And that's the way it starts. And I think that if we didn't have that, we'd, we'd be better people. What about the, uh, the uh, there was a, a course, uh, the rampant homosexuality, which they always talk about in prison. And in some cases, I saw an interview years ago where they talked about uh, a, uh, a fellow said, hey, uh, help me, I'm being pack raped. And the guard said, forget about it, it's inevitable. I'm not saying any of that towards you, that's not what I mean. But wouldn't there be a fear in a, in a heterosexual mind like yourself that you, you, you run into this place and suddenly that could even be violated by a group of guys who decided that they wanted to do it with no protection from waters or anything? Jeez, I've never been attractive to guys, you know. Don't I work well, you don't have to be attractive for them to grab you. Right? I don't well, think they care much what you look like if they're going to grab you. I've no? never had a decent offer, uh, ever. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I... Uh, I, of course it happens, but there are gay people everywhere in the world, and, and there are, you know, bullies who rape women or men. I mean, those bullies exist everywhere, and I, I don't think that's... Uh, well, move off of that for a minute, then. Let's go with the bullies. Are there, is, it, is it like another society inside there? Are there guys who hold the power uh, more so than others, who oh, dictate right. what, how the jail works? Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, I had a nasty period when I was... Um, when they sort of grabbed me and locked me up in a, in a maximum security jail over... a a supposed, you know, printing episode. and um, That was the, with the bull sales? With the bull poster, you with know. With the bull posters, yeah, right. Um, yeah. And that was, um, it was just a scam, you know, and uh, I mean, I was accused of... A scam on your part or a scam on them well, reporting? Well, I a scam on their part. I mean, there was a shock horror thing in the <coughs> paper and um, there was a situation where I was accused of um, using illegally jail printing press and all that stuff and uh, you can't fight, you know, you can't argue and as it's turned out now, um, the jail uh, made a written, a printed quote, wrote out a manufacturing order, five copies to print the posters at a special price, and then one of the warders tore all the pages out of the book, and I was left there, like, holding the 
the poster, I suppose. Um, and uh, pretty spooky. And when I went to that maximum security thing for six weeks, uh, I couldn't believe what was happening. I just couldn't believe my eyes. Well, who moved you to maximum security? All through the course of this book, you keep sort of hinting, Harry, that there's somebody out to get you in there that was not allowing you to have the basics. Now, certainly, you shouldn't have been sent to maximum security for what you did, but well, yet you were and left there. Yeah, I was really left there, and I... Well, I who went, was out to get you like God that? God knows. We have, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, but it was pretty spooky. And it's only now where the warder was charged, and he said in court, um, I, I panicked. You know, I tore the pages out of the book, blah, blah, blah. I kept saying pages out of the book. No, believe me. Uh, and uh, it's only this year, you know, that I've been able to um, have a bull poster, which I just happen to have with me. Is this this year's bull sale? This is this year's bull. Well, this one's legitimate, folks. It was what printed I on our Channel 9 printing press. Six Dunmore Manila, seven Delphi or Red Bulls. <laughs> hey, you're Gary. You come on national television and plug your damn bulls again. Oh, well. But, I know, guess you and Bulls are closely associated. One, 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 of, one of the real problems, what I'd like to see happen is I'd like to see uh, people uh, have a good look at their kids. I'd like to see us start with young kids a bit earlier, you know. I, I was once doing an application for a young boy, 20, and... Um, is he in prison, you mean? Yep. Yeah. And I looked at this kid, and I was talking to him about getting a job, you know. And the more I talked to him, the more I realised that he couldn't earn enough money no matter what he did. He was a hearing addict. And I thought maybe he'd get a job as a brain surgeon or a, a lawyer. They make a lot of money. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but I suddenly looked at him and I said, look, it, it wouldn't matter if you earn two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, because that isn't enough. Mm. And he looked at me and I, and I said, unless you can throw your hair and have it, you're buggered, son, aren't you? And he looked at me and a tear came into the eye and he agreed that he was. And here was a young boy who, because he's an addict, is gone forever. He's doomed to be an armed robber. That's pretty spooky, Don. Yeah, well, you put the jail and you're an addict, there's no way out of it. You know? How did you handle it emotionally yourself? In the book, you say you cried a lot the first week or so that you were there. I mean, like oh, when, no, when the no. shock finally hit no, you. I'm what? not saying there's anything weak in that. I mean, oh, you know. I can assure you there's not. No, I, I was... I think cool. everybody, by the way, should go to jail once and see what it's like, and yeah. there'd be a lot better people around, I'll tell you now. <laughs> Now, what, now what I, what I, I went. think, what I, yeah, <laughs> well, sure, what I think happens for all of us, I, I didn't disintegrate until they locked me up in a maximum security jail. And they, they really locked me up for six weeks, 17 and a half hours a day. And I cried till I had nothing left. I mean, I was dry inside. I really didn't think I'd make it. And through, and I mean this, through uh, the support of people in the industry, you know, Graham, Bert, all the people I know, writing letters, my family, people that cared about me, kept saying, don't collapse. And I really thought I, I would, but I finally pulled through. But it was horrendous. And, I mean, to be offered exercise when you've got one set of clothes and it's raining in a yard with a cage over it, it's a bit crazy, you know, mm. all that sort of stuff. So. You know, but finally, uh, as I describe it in the book, it's the kind of experience you almost wouldn't want to miss. Mm. Because now you look around and you think, gee, I'm, you know, I'm up and, and I'm about and I'm working. Uh, I can maybe help some more people, put, make some films, do some more things. And um, it makes you, got to make you a different person. Not harder, but just more understanding. Well, harder, harder is a, a, a good operative word here, Harry. You, you said in the book, uh, you reached a point after a while where you absolutely had no fear anymore yeah. of things. Whereas you were really frightened when you first went in, you suddenly reach yeah. a turning point where you say, look, I'm just not afraid of any of this anymore. Yeah, what happened What happened in that dreadful incarceration, um, where they really locked me up, I, when I did pack up, I, one morning, a couple of weeks later, was shaving and I looked in the mirror and I looked at my face and there was something missing. And what I realised I'd done that in putting myself back together again, I hadn't p picked up the bit that had fear written on it. And I looked at my eyes and I couldn't believe it, that I just wasn't frightened anymore of anything. I don't think I ever will be now till the day I die. Mm. Not that make, it doesn't make you bolder or cheeky, it just makes you not frightened. And what's the future hold now, huh? The future, well. You're gonna do, you, I heard you say on 60 40. Minutes you were gonna do Compu Ticket again. Are you well, gonna do Compu well, Ticket again? Well, people have asked me, you know, it was a long time ago and what people now realize was what I really saw. Um, people, you know, young kids now look at computing and say, yeah, we know about that, but that's only two years. Young kids have been working computers and all that. Yeah. So we've had a lot of pressure from people who were slow going on, who said, look, we, we feel it ought to happen again. We now know what you meant. Mm. And maybe uh, next year, 
um, or the year after, we will do it again. Couple of priorities to fill in first, um, <laughs> but uh, but but we but I think we might because it was it was the best idea I ever had in my whole life, mm -hmm. the very best. Well. Uh Wherever direction it goes in, I'm sure you're going to be hearing a lot more of Harry M. Miller. He's a guy you can't really keep out of the news. Uh, this is his story. That's the book, My Story by Harry M. Miller. If you want to hear it out of a horse's mouth, you get a chance to see it for yourself. Thank him for coming in. Harry M. Miller. We'll be back. We got more show, I think. <laughs> May I introduce internationally renowned beauty therapist? <laughs> internationally. <laughs> what is the matter, Don? <laughs> Nothing. You're laughing at these. I have used these products for six months. I don't do that. I have, and they are excellent. Internationally. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Internationally. You should see under my arms. <laughs> And also... Never mind, yeah. I don't want to see anywhere else. <laughs> Internationally renowned beauty therapist, Jan Smith for more. Hello, Say Jan. hello How to do you Jan. Do? Nice Jan. to meet hello you. Hello Jan Smith for more. Nice to meet you. This is, uh... Okay. This is, uh, hello. You say How hello. do you do? Uh, hello, Jan. Nice to meet nice you again. To meet you, you know Al Johnson, of course, back there, don't you? You know, right. tell me about the famous Black More Life mask, That's please, Jan. That's this mask. You That's see this? They there. paint that on a girl's face, I tell you. Amazing. So yes, Amazing. It's also amusing. It really is indeed. Yes. Right. Is, is it my turn? Yes, yes it, it is. is. I'm wow. sorry, Jan. Yes, I forgot you were here right. for a minute. Whenever you hear a silence, get in there for yes, your that's life. It. Go ahead, sweetheart. Sell your little... Well, what's this off? Yeah, go ahead. Well, the Black More mask comes directly from the earth. Everything seems rosy when you're far from home. Is what you'll be saying uh, no, when you're far from me. I hear the footsteps walking down the hallway in the middle of the night. I'm sorry, Jan, I beg your pardon. Okay, just a little bit of frivolity there. Yes. Just imagine the time you're getting for nothing. I'm just wondering what you'd look like with the more mask on with your face now. Well, you know, did you know that the more life mask is a substance Don, that's taken... down in front I'm of a sorry. lady, please. It's a substance that's taken from nature in its no, pure no, form no, 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 and imported from Austria under the control of the Aust Austrian Moore Research Institute. That's true, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. that was I took lines. your lines trying to get Thank you onto this. Doesn't the mask have a deep cleansing effect, it's eliminating certain... toxins and removing dead surface cells to minimise wrinkles? Am I just imagining that? <laughs> You can say, and, and other more life preparations, uh, compliments the mask, achieving a healthier skin. Jane, go, you're yeah, in now. Go ahead, you. You right. And here are the other products. We have the Morph Cleansing Bar, the Skin Toner, the Face Cream. And a bomb. <laughs> really missed your cue again. Have you got a I, feeling there's no I chance thought... of getting a Logie for this commercial? <laughs> <laughs> I thought Balm went to Adelaide as a coach. Didn't he go there? There's way? a Balm to protect against the effects right. of sun and also wind if you That's happen to right. suffer from it. Don, because yes. more life is created entirely by nature, yes. they're absolutely free because there's no overhead. <laughs> <laughs> no, all preparations are suitable for all skin types. They are. Oily, dry, or damaged, or uh, normal skin, regardless of age, these are, these are terrific products for your skin. More right. life, don't forget that name, more life. Sort of like Patra, more life. <laughs> it's nature's gift for your skin. At beauticians, pharmacies. And, and major departments. That's my line, right, Jen. Yes. We rehearsed this afternoon, yes. and I said I was going to do major, major department stores. Look for line. more I'm life. Supposed to it's say out. Major department no. stores. The only line I had in this commercial was major <laughs> department stores. More Everything life seems rosy when and you're far from, from home. Um, we've got a wonderful singer. Is Lynn Bryant wearing those boots up to there and all of that? And the, and the look? Well, you see the outfit on Lynn Bryant tonight. It is sensational. She's with us tonight. Lynn tonight is replacing Wendy and the Rockets, who are going to be here with us tonight. Well, hang on just a moment. Just a minute. Lynn is a fine singer. Wendy and the Rockets were called to London by their recording company. That's where they are now. This lady has stepped in. You're going to love the number she's doing. It's Donna Summer's hit. She works hard for the money, and she's a butte worker, too. Here she is, Lynn Bryant. Come on.
terrific at doing a great number. She works hard for the money. She sure does, too. Nice outfit. Good on you, lady. Lovely stuff. This man's name is Ken Hames. And um, I just want you to meet him because what we have in front of us is something extraordinary and revolutionary. It's called the Phantom Computer Chess Set. It's distributed by Milton Bradley, the famous toy people. And uh, Ken, of course, is the expert that we've called in to have a look at this. Now, um, this was, I understand the, the computer chess, but this was played against the Victorian, uh, current Victorian women's champion, and she had to concede defeat twice. Is that right? That's right, on Saturday. <laughs> yes. Well, Ken, where did the idea for this come? How did this originate? Yeah? Well, it was all made and produced in America, uh -huh. Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh -huh. That's where they produced and made, and uh, they only hit the country last Thursday. Okay, well, let's have a look at uh, what goes on. I'm not really a chess person, and I don't really understand, but I'm able to comprehend what goes on with this thing. This is, you're not going to believe this when you see it. It's unreal. Uh, well, suppose you demonstrate some of the moves that can be made here and what can go on. Right. Well, you can play against the machine, or you can make the machine play itself. Right. If I just do some of the normal moves, as if I'm playing the machine... So you'll be playing against the machine yes. now? Now, the standard move, of course, is, is this pawn here. Right. Now, so that the computer knows what you're doing, you must tell it which man you've picked up right. and where you're going to put it. To register that, I just touch it there and then touch it there and then he will now have his shot. How's that for scary stuff? <laughs> I'll do some unethical shots here, but uh, that's just to show you how it works. He's thinking. I've lost that pawn. Oh, they've taken that right off the board. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look at this. I see. Now, what I'll do here now yeah. is take one of these, put him in check, and being a tidy machine and he likes to keep things in its correct position, yeah. this pawn belongs there, but I'll put it up here and he'll put it down there for me anyway to keep it tidy. <laughs> Isn't that unbelievable? <laughs> That's brilliant. Now, I will now lose that queen. Right. I see, he took... Now, if I'm a little bit stumped and don't know what to do, yeah. I can ask the computer for a hint. Oh. So I just hit the hint button, and it tells me which man to move. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. That's the best possible shot that I have now got at the moment. Uh -huh. So if I did that again, I'm now putting the king in check. He even rectifies it in the middle there. And now it's his shot. Right. Now, there are 12 levels that you can play this machine on. Yeah. Uh, oh. Level one, it lets you win. And that's the level I like. <laughs> <laughs> that's always a good level to have. Yeah, that's yes. right. Uh, what about resetting the board up and stuff? If you mix them all up and stuff, does it set up by itself too? No, it's, it, when you first set your men up, yeah. it, it takes note of exactly the position of every man. If I messed that up now, the computer would get... What if you made a wrong move? It rejects it, right? If I made a false move, in other words, if I tried to put that sideways, which is an incorrect move, because it must only go those ways, yeah. the whole board lights up and it makes a funny noise, meaning it's a false move and you cannot do that move. Right, I see. It will only let you and, do the correct move. And, and what about setting up? Can you, can you do it so that it sets up real quick? Set up. It will now set up for a brand new game. Automatically. Oh my God, that's unbelievable. Look at this. It's the most advanced computer system in the world today, as far as oh. chess goes. That is incredible. Look at that. <laughs> One left, you forgot him. Oh, no, he didn't. That's over there. And if I push the button here, automatic, it will now play itself. Oh my, look at this. How did it go against the men's champion? The, men, the men's champion beat it twice. He beat it twice, did he? Yes. Yeah? He even told me, see how the way it just did a little dance around there? Yeah. Got he it even told me that in three shots he would have it in checkmate, and he did. He did, huh? Oh, I see. It gets one, moves it out of the way so the other one yes. can move from the back. Isn't that something? Yes. I want it to go until it takes somebody off. What's it doing now? Thinking? It's thinking. Oh. I can't believe it. Nobody... Hang on, it's thinking again. Shh, no noise, it's thinking. <laughs> Each of the 12 levels, it takes longer to have a shot. Right. Whenever you turn the machine on, it is automatically on level two. Right. Well, so uh, far, nobody's taken anybody off. No, it's, it's thinking a lot about it.
Now, there should be some action now, I'll bet. I'll bet about three guys go off now in a row. Yeah, no. no, not yet. I'm gonna stay here till somebody goes off. That's it. Send him off the mug. Oh, right. If you're playing... Ken, if you make a false move with one of these pieces, that they get reported? <laughs> it's gonna do a castle here, which is very difficult, but it does a little dance around itself. Right. You reset. But no one's gone off yet. You just want to see it reset. Okay. Okay. Well, press the reset button, and we'll watch it set up again. And we can go away to a commercial while we do. The Phantom Computer Chess Set's distributed by Milton Bradley, Australia. And what's the price, by the way? Should I ask? A lot of people think it's well over two or three thousand dollars. The recommended retail price is eight hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Oh, is that all? I'll take six. <laughs> Anyway, there it is, resetting up for another game. Hey, I'll tell you what, if you want to learn about chess, it's a good way to go. Okay, thank you very much, Ken. A pleasure thank talking you. to you, and I'll tell you what, it's an amazing little boy. Absolutely amazing. We'll be back. I'll go back. Thank you. Hundreds of enthusiasts throughout Australia compete in the sport of pigeon racing. Uh, my next guest tonight is a man who's been breeding and racing pigeons for well over 30 years. So who better to tell us about pigeons and the sport of pigeon racing? His name is Fred Farmer. He's a delightful character. You're really going to love him. Would you make him welcome, please? Ladies and gentlemen, Fred Farmer here. <laughs> Well, Fred, I think we better start right away with uh, you telling me the difference. Uh, what is the difference between a homing pigeon and a racing pigeon? Well, <coughs> why well, find out a homing pigeon? Oh, he's a slow coach, Don. A homing pigeon yeah, he's is slow. a slow coach, yes. You, you feed him up and he gets real fat. Now, just have a look at this one. Look at the size of that. He's not being cruel to these now. If anybody no. calls about the handling, Fred's been handling pigeons for 30 years and he knows exactly See what they're doing. how big he is? Like, well, it, he doesn't look much bigger to me than a normal pigeon. No, nah, but he is. Look, look, feel how fat he is. See? Oh, yes. He's got all that avoirdupois on, and he's a bit slow when he's come out. All that avoirdupois well, yeah, on? Yeah, that's a yes. bit, you know, a bit heavy, yes. Right. And, and then you... you see, what, is he a racing pigeon? Yes, he's, he's in the racing family, but he's not a... But he's too fat to be a racing yeah, pigeon. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, he's see. a homer, what you were saying, see? Right. Now, I think we've got a nice little one, a, a smaller one here. Right. Now, this is a better one. See, now this is a racing pigeon. Much lighter in frame. Uh-huh. Less heavy. And a cleaner cut pigeon. So if he's smaller, lighter, yeah. obviously he can, yeah. he can well, fly further and... Uh, and quicker. And quicker. Because he's not pulling so much weight through the air. Oh. And he's covered... Uh, cover feathers are well, all the same. Well, if you're going to do things like that, hold it up just a little, will you? So we can... Uh, the camera see? can have a look at that when you spread it out then, see? see? He's got much the same wing. But he's not as big, and he's a, a race pigeon, see? He right. races for a home. A homer just... He likes his home, but a racer wants to get there in a, in a hurry. How many different breeds are there? There's one there with a, a white tail. What is that one? Talk about him last. Talk about him last. OK, we'll talk about him later. Ah. How, many, how many different breeds of pigeons are there that you... Oh, there's, there's many different breeds uh -huh. and many different colours. But in Australia, through uh, <coughs> important from England, Ireland and Belgium, we've got many breeds. And but what they're about... still thorough, though. They're many mixed breeds. They're still a thoroughbred. It's funny, isn't it? No, it's still a thoroughbred. Funny. I understand. There's many mixed breeds of dogs, but a lot of them are thoroughbreds, too. Yeah. What, and... what, how many, how many uh, are there in a race, uh, when you have a race? 6,000, 7,000, 15,000. So I let many? go 6,500 of a Saturday. 6,500 pigeons yeah, race on a Saturday? Yeah, from anywhere starting from Swansea in New South Wales to Sydney. They're at Moorlambart at the present moment. 400 miles. 400 miles. Yeah, man, I don't so what do you do? You ship them somewhere, uh, in a big, and, and the in race a van, is coming yeah, home. Yeah. But they all go to different locations coming home. Oh, yes, that's the art. Oh, right. That's the art. They know how to uh, a home on a beam or something. We're not quite sure how to do Do you lose do any? Uh, uh... Yeah, 50%. But we don't know why we lose them. It's like a good sort. You take her out and you give her a good dinner, 
The next time you go to meet the illusion, you can't understand what you're doing wrong. <laughs> That's a fact, isn't it? Right? That's a fact. Same with the pigeon. You feed them, water them, and send them away, yeah. and then they just forget to come home. You might be better. You might be better off taking a pigeon to dinner. It would be a... maybe. What? Maybe. A, what is the homing instinct? How come they know where to how to come home? Well, that's something that nobody knows. Not even the greatest scientist of the day can find it out. And if we ever find that out, that'll be the end. Well, Fred, let me ask you this. You, you take them to, like, you buy a pigeon, and you take it to your... Now, how does he know that that's home? How does he know not to go to the home he was at previously, or two homes ago? No, no, no. Well, when you breed them as babies, and you only breed them to one home, like that ah, box. Ah, I see. I breed them as babies just to that box. Right. He eats in that box, he drinks in that box, and he sleeps in it. And so, how do you, never mind where I take that box, he knows where his home is. And how do you train them in... Uh, what do you feed them? Peas, wheat, corn, milo, anything you mention, any seed. And how do you train them? Do you... Uh, do you I mean, well, there must be some training you go through to teach them. You don't go, hey, this is home, you know. No, you know. no, no. When they're babies, about five weeks old, you just, just imagine that was your land and board. You just sit them all on there, they can't even... The babies are sitting out there on a big board like that, and they can't even fly. Mm. But they know inside is their home, because that's right. where they're born in the back here. Right. So they go through the bobs when, when they're sitting out in the, uh, in the light long enough. They just go through the little bobs and jump down, and they learn to have a drink of water and a food. And you keep on doing that, and as they start to fly, you hold them in your hand, just like this. We haven't got much time, have we? We're all right. Don't you worry about time. It's fine. We'll take See, care of the time. When they're little, just we imagine, haven't got much time. Can you hurry it up? Just imagine a little baby. <laughs> just imagine that's a little baby four weeks, five weeks old. We'll see. He's in front there on the board, and you're flapping him like that. See? <laughs> this is an old bloke. He's, he's cunning, see? Yeah. You know? And then you just let them jump onto the board. Right. And then that teaches them to, to flap onto the board. And then as the days go on and the weeks go on, they fly on their own. Yeah. And they come back. Just oh, like there you that. go. That's a flap on the board. I that's see. Right. Yeah, see that's what, what I mean? they do. You've got to teach them to do that. Right. That's me there, isn't it? Is that you? That's me, yes. That's a pretty snazzy shirt you got yeah. on there, mate. That's the barber shirt. Is that... I mean, so those are your pigeons? Yeah, that's my pigeons. How many are in there? How many are you keeping there? That's not that, you. Yeah, that's... Oh, that's you without your glasses. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> How about that? Oh, oh! Yeah. That's me. You're not a bad-looking bloke without your glasses, no, you know that? That's right. <laughs> There they, are, there they are, all coming well, listen, down. Listen, when you wear your glasses, do the pigeons have trouble recognizing oh, you in order to come down? No, no, as long as I've got the food and the tin in the hand, that's all they want. Now, how do you call them in, mate? Come on, 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 come on. And they can hear me from two miles away. They didn't even move. Yeah, but these are not mine. These are not yours. No. Don't be a sneak. You didn't tell me that. No. No. Tell me about the Phantom. Who, did you win a race? This, what's this they tell me about? There's a whole bunch of pigeons missing and they're somewhere else on some island or something. Somewhere. Yeah, Lord Howe Island from Taree. They got caught up in about a 90 mile westerly wind off uh, Raymond Terrace. That's up in the Hunter Valley. And they ended up in Norfolk Island. Yes, well, right. how are you going to get them back? Well, they, the, the, when they get fit, they might fly back, but we've had a few brought back in the aeroplane, you know? Yeah. But uh, we don't expect many back. Did they, <laughs> yeah. did they tell the pilot how to get home? <laughs> oh, yeah, they navigate. Oh, yeah, they navigate. Is it the pilot in the cockpit going, where do we go now? Where do we go now? Here we go. Where do we go? Where do we go? <laughs> Show yeah. me the fantail. Is that the white one? Yeah. I've assumed that's the fantail. Yeah. What's, uh, that's a very fancy looking bird. Is that a racer? No, nah, no. Nah, this is the decoy. The decoy? The decoy, yeah. This what is, do you mean by decoy? Well, this is the one you do. You, you wait in your backyard there and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and looking at the sky and. No, see nothing, and all of a sudden you, you think you see something. Yeah. And you go like that, see? And now the bird flying through the sky, you can see that. But you know what now? With new neck technology, yeah. he's finished. He's like that 10% unemployed. We've made him 100% unemployed. What do you do now? I'll tell you. I knew you, you would. Just put him in there. I had faith in you. See? Wait a minute, take now, him out again. Just take him out again. Oh, certainly. Take certainly. him out just for a second. Okay, you want, you want a picture? You, this is the Pigeon Fancier magazine. He wants yeah. a picture for the cover. Hold the Pigeon Fancier up. Hold him up. Hold him up. Smile later, Barry. Okay, one more. Come on. Another one. No, no, hold the pigeon up. Hey. Okay, that's the cover. All right? Good. Now, we finish that. Now, good. Now, you see, with the two new technology, we've got what we call a mechanical fan tail. Mechanical, he is. Yeah? Like the computer <coughs> chessboard. Yes. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Real modern, right? So, How's that for tying stuff yeah, together? That's we, called threading things together. Yeah, we've got a, a motor and a big steel pipe. And it goes up in the air, right up about 16 feet, and on the top of him, we've got a, we've made a mechanical fantail with wings and everything. 
and it, a big rod comes right down and it's hooked onto the machine and we just turn the machine and this is how it goes. Flap, bin, flap, bin, flap, bin, flap, bin. And do you know what, Don? He'll flap all day, all night. We don't have to feed him. We don't have to water him. We don't have to clean up after him either, mate. And that makes it easy. And he flaps and he doesn't even moan. Just that, like that, 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 that's just like that, is it? That's like that. Okay, we'll be back oh, after this for it. Don't you go away. I got it, I got it. It's all right, don't worry. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Tonight, uh, we're having a quick look over some of the great bar mix products soon to be available. Uh, the coffee maker that was voted best in America from 27 other makes. Look at that. That's it there. The bar mix Krups iron, um, coffee maker iron has, <laughs> has a fantastic little time clock down there so it brews your coffee on time. Plus, it has a no drip feature there. And coffee usually drips. That's, yeah, that's right. That's a terrific little feature. And it's not uh, a cheap throwaway, but substantial quality like all bar mix products are. And here's our steam iron that gives more steam. And look, a lift out water tank. That's another winner. And bar mix now have the brilliant Cassette Deluxe food machine in stock again. And Teresa has another bargain right here. Yes, Don, everybody that buys a bar mix food machine this week will receive our beautiful new linen tea towel absolutely free. Just like the open you've got on. It says bar mix, my little hero. My little hero. And remember, prices start at $75. And you flap, and then you flap, 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 flap. <laughs> Phone bar mix around Australia to order, or better still, why don't you call at the bar mix stores tomorrow? Remember the name, Barmix, simply brilliant. Thank you. I love saying this word. It's just terrific to say it. Kamal. <laughs> Somehow when you say it, it has to come out that way. Say. Listen, folks, he's wearing a dinner suit. No gold lame on this bloke tonight, I'll tell you. <laughs> Kamal is about to embark on a tour of Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, he's with us tonight. We are very happy to say he's one of our favorite people and one of the finest recording artists and biggest selling recording artists this country has ever seen. Here he is now to sing for us. Kamal! Yes. <laughs> Once you have found her, never let her go. And when you find her, love her, love her, love her. Some enchanted evening, you may see a stranger, you may see a stranger across a cross. And somehow you know, you know, even then, that somewhere you'll see her again and again. Some enchanted evening, someone may be laughing. Laughing across a crowded room, and night after night, as strange as it seems, the sound of a laughter will sing in your dreams. Who can explain it? Who can tell you why? Fools give you reasons, wise men never try. Some enchanted evening, when you find your true love, when you feel her call you across a crowded room, then fly to her side. 
I began my career about 19 years ago. The, in the 19 so. years ago, I had to hire one of these. <laughs> or 20 years ago. Now you own the factory, right? Not quite, not quite. <laughs> At least I can pay for the rent now. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you back on tour again, huh? Yes, yeah. and uh, going back to your country when that is over. When? Wait, wait, not your, so much uh, next to your country, country, your second yeah. country. Yeah, where, where, when are you going back to America? I'm, when I finish the Victorian tour, I eventually go to uh, North America. Uh, first to Canada, yeah. doing a whole uh, Canadian tour. You're going back to Hawaii? Uh, not this year. Ah, you're going I've just time. been, sort of, yeah? so, yeah. I got my suntan anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> they give me one, I gotta go. Yeah. I wanted to say hello to you. Right. No, you okay. just say oh. it, I come out here, yes. All right. It's I'm the first I've ever been on, you haven't asked me to show your, your album cover. If you want to show it, I just happened to have one. So I wanted to no. know that now. No, so. no I, I, didn't, I didn't have an album okay. released just now. There was one you talked about uh, a few months ago. Okay, that no was worries. Enough. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. All the best of luck. And uh, happy birthday on the 13th of November. Oh, because, thank you. Because thank we have the birthday on the same day. His birthday and my birthday are the same day. We're having our birthday show, big 50th birthday. I'm going to be 50 I'll in be November. In, uh, I'll How be old in are you going to be? Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, I'll be in a place called Kitchener in, in Canada. On we'll the cross today and yeah. say hello to Kamal well, on the 50th birthday. Yeah. That'd be good, too. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks, mate. Okay. Good to see you. Take care, will you? All right. Come on, everybody. <laughs> for those of you who may be watching us and for our studio audience and everybody else, it's any place you may be interested if you haven't heard it yet. Uh, running third, the, these are the final counts in the Brownlow Medal. Third place, uh, Simon Madden with 22 votes from Essendon. Second place, Morris Rioli, 23 votes from Richmond. And the winner, Ross Glenn Denning, 24 votes from North Melbourne. So there you go, that's it. It's your Brown Low medal winner. Well, he ran second last year. He deserved to win it this year, I guess. Everybody picked Ross Glenn Denning. Uh, careful, he might hear you. I can't tell you enough about this. It's a new Australian movie. It's gonna be released later this week. Already, it is receiving rave reviews from critics. It's starring a stunning Wendy Hughes. I promise you, like you have never seen her, she comes up like a modern-day Ava Gardner. She is beautiful, so uh, unbelievable. Robin Nevin, John Hargraves, and the very young and talented newcomer, Nicholas Glidhill. Now, uh, he's a, a, a little boy. I don't even know how old he is. He must be about six or seven or something. He's unbelievable. They've all been nominated for awards at next week's AFI Awards, the Movie Awards. Uh, the movie is set in Sydney in the 1930s. It is a beautiful and touching but powerful film. Here is a scene. Just have a look at this. Because your father's a bad man. Isn't it a good thing she died? Hmm? And aren't you glad to have me to protect you from him? Oh, darling, darling, come here, darling. Don't worry. Don't worry. Logan can't get you. Because you belong to me. Grown up man, all the things we'll do together. And how nice it'll be for me, too. I'll have a man to take me to the theater. The opera. No, I won't go. What? I won't go. Did he tell you to say that? No. Did he? I won't go away on that boat. I'll get the police. Stop that! I won't go away from Lila and George. Did you tell Logan that? No, I didn't. Yes, yes, you did. Didn't you? No, I didn't. You're as bad as he is. He's not bad. He's not. Sit down in that chair, please. No. Sit in that chair. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I can't describe this film. It's very powerful. The drunken father they talked about, uh, the father actually, he's a, a, a drunk. His name is Logan uh, in the play. He is brilliantly played by our next guest, John Hargraves. Make him welcome, please. Here, right. <laughs> I have never had the pleasure of talking before, and before we go into all the details about this film, I want to publicly say you are brilliant in this movie. Absolutely brilliant. It's just, uh, it's wonderful to see, mate. Thank you. Yeah, really terrific. Tell me, tell us a little about the storyline of this, this young boy. Uh... Well, it's, uh, it's basically a custody battle um, for a six-year-old child between two aunts. Uh, one, Lila, and, and the husband, George. That's have, Robin Nevin. Yeah, yeah. Have brought him up since the death of his mother, he, who died... <coughs> Uh, just after giving birth to him. And um, for six years, he's been brought up by Lila and George, who are a homely, working-class couple. And they have a very rich sister, Vanessa, played by Wendy Hughes, who comes back from England, who's always been obsessed with the father that mm. I play, Logan. And uh, she wants the child as a substitute for the father. Right. And there ensues a very bitter battle. But, of course, uh, the boy has never seen you as a father. No. No, we'll show a scene in a minute about that. That's terrific. Tell me about the boy. He is astounding in this film. He's been nominated for a uh, Best, Best Actor, Actor Award. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> a little heavy, but we won't even go into that. <laughs> uh, where, do, where does he come from? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Nicholas Gledhill. Yeah. He's uh, an actor's son, Arthur Dignam. Oh, very yes. fine actor. Oh, yeah. And uh, he's never acted before, and... He's just wonderful. Oh, yes, yeah. just terrific. Yeah. This is a, an amazing cast of people. You all seem to gel so well. I mean, did it, was, it as, uh, was it as comfortable working on this film as it was the way it comes across? Yes, very comfortable. It was wonderful working with the director. And we all sort of know each other. Most of the people in the film have worked together before. Yeah. And uh, in fact, most of the cast, um, we did Present Laughter in Sydney at the Royal a few months ago. Ah. And most of us have worked together before. Wendy, I've known for 15 years, you know, the old bag. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, you can't call her an old bag. Now, in this film, she comes up better looking than I have ever seen her in films. She's a st I used an analogy yeah. before. I said a modern-day Ava Gardner, because that's what she reminds me of. But yes. the classy clothes and the way she looks is unreal. Yeah. Well, who designed the clothes? Was there a couturier or something? No, a, a very talented man called Bruce Finlayson, mm. who um, got together the wardrobe and designed the, the whole look. Yeah. But it is stunning. It's the most glamorous film I think we've ever made. When you're working on a film as dramatic as this with all these little insights, you know, the, uh, everybody fighting against Terry against everyone else, does it ever carry over personally? No, not when you've known each other for so long. Right. You know? yeah. no. Well, let me show you a very touching scene. Uh, this is the scene where you and the boy meet for the first time. Your yeah. son, and you've come back. I've never seen him. You've never seen him. Mm. This is, uh, I'll show you just what I mean about performance now. Have a look at this. See you. She wants to take you away. Where? England. Could I come home to Lila on Fridays? No, it's, um, it's a long, long way away, P.S. It'd be until you've grown up. Would you want to? Well, don't you worry about it. I'll fix her. It's one thing I can do. Not much in seven years, but it's something. So don't worry about it, okay? Is it all right now to tell everyone I've got a father? Yeah, it's all right, it is. Why don't you live here? Did you love dear one? Oh, yes. Very much so. <laughs> That's a little one of those. Woo! And I was just noticing, Robin, my researcher said today something that I hadn't even really noticed either because I was looking at clips. The music is wonderful in this. Isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. You don't know who's, do you know who's responsible for that? Yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot. Ray Cook. 
originally an Australian who's been living in London since the 60s. Uh -huh. And he came back especially to, to write the music for this. Right. But um, I think so often in, in films that I've been in, um, one of the things that's often let a film down is the music. Mm. And uh, I think in Australian films it's been a problem, but it's not a problem in oh, this one. It's this is, you are going to win, when they win awards for this, boy, I tell you, it's going to take off like a rocket. It is some picture. Uh, well, I just want to look at, I just want you to have a look at a scene before we go. <laughs> I want to give you as much of this as I can, because I really think a lot of it. Tell me about the locations for this. The house, the big house that she's in. Uh, the big house place. that was Vanessa's, um, exists in Darling Point in Sydney, yeah. which is a pretty ritzy suburb. Uh, Turak, okay. And, uh, it's, um, the street scene, it was it? built by a, a nouveau riche millionaire in, a, in, the ni in about 1908. Uh -huh. And it's a huge, gloomy pile, really. Yeah. But uh, they touted it up, you know, and it looks terrific <laughs> in the film. <laughs> well, you should be thrilled about this, John. I just want everybody to have a look at one more scene before we go. Just take a look at this. This is uh, at the railway station. Uh, yeah. doesn't send people flocking to the theaters, I don't know which will. John Hargrave, it's a pleasure to meet you for the first time, mate. You're a delight. And I oh, hope the thanks. film is everything is. And give my regards to Wendy. Tell us you should come on this show sometime. I am a big fan of hers and I want to meet her. I will. In fact, she said before I came, yeah, because we're staying at the Windsor, and she said, tell Don he's a doll. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, the, feel the feeling is mutual. We could be starting something here. John Hargrave, everybody will be back. Don't go away. Thank you. to Don's Wheel, and tonight the major prize, the new Pulsar GL hatchback sedan from Motorfast, featuring five-speed manual overdrive gearbox, plus the brilliant 1.5-litre engine. The Pulsar is valued at $8,750 on the road from Motorfast, your Nissan Datsun dealer in Commercial Road, South Yarra. Also on the wheel, a prize on the ocean waves, cruise sit Mars sunny South Pacific on the fun-filled Fairstar, where the lowest fares under the sun cover your accommodation, food, and world-class entertainment. Tonight's contestant could win this exquisite diamond ring from Theodore Fine Jewelry. Jewelry that is beautiful, easy to wear, and affordable. New on the wheel tonight from Colonial Fireplaces, this beautifully designed fireplace in handcrafted antique beaten copper. With the double skinned hood, you're able to enjoy the warmth around a Colonial Fireplace, the total look in fireplaces. And you could win a trip for two with Australian Pacific to Tasmania. Travel in luxury air-conditioned, toilet-equipped Mercedes-Benz coaches with first-class accommodation, most meals, and sightseeing expenses included. And now, your prize performer, here's Bert! Move along, Willie. Yes. Why did you always tell me that? Like, it's my fault. I get it. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everyone. This is Bert Newton. One, two, three. Good evening, Bert. One, two, three. Sir Albert. Sir, that's right, Sir Albert of uh, the, the Hutt River. Right. Every, every night a message from Peter Feynman. Peter Feynman saying we've got three minutes or whatever. Now, I've got this here, which he instructed that's a me. Telex roll. Yeah. Which I might take up and jam it right up his nose because we have not got. No, 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 no you need more than that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Listen, with this. Don't telex... tell me, hurry up. It's not my problem. The man is this here is, with the telex and he's got a piece idea. of I, this can't, is... I won't do it. <laughs> it's all right. I understand. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I'll take care of you. 
It's all, no, it's all right. Don't worry. It's all right. Don't what is he after all? I know how Only a you. genius. It's okay. He hurts you. It's all right. Don't I'll worry. I'll go and get it. Yes. I right. suddenly realized it's very important you do this. This is a talix, right? And it's a very interesting talix. Got you so far? This was sent by radio station Two Day FM in Sydney. It's 57 and a half metres long, uh, the talix, not the station. It took nine and a half hours to transmit. 5,000 signatures, the cost approximately $1,000, and of course, you know where it went, don't you? It went to, that's half the message, it went to Australia too. And what a wonderful idea. Yeah. I mean, of us showing you. See, look at that. Isn't it what, a, was it, what was it supposed to be? What is well, it? it was to congratulate everybody. Pardon? Stop it now. Oh, eh? Oh, gently. I, do they want it back? <laughs> My God, what a fool. Do they want it back? They want it back? Why would they want it back? For what reason do they want Call it back? Call up the card. Because huh? it cost $1,000. That's why they want oh. it back. Two Day FM, a wonderful FM station well, in Sydney. Well, One here. of the best well, radio stations that I've ever heard, heard in my life. Well, I'm sorry. I'll get That's this back to you. I'm flying up to Sydney okay. tomorrow okay. afternoon. Okay. And, I'll, and I do apologise. I know some of the owners. John Laws. We'll meet the contestants. Okay. I really am sorry about that. We're sorry about that. We didn't mean... What a wonderful idea sending it that way. Get Patty to iron it. Yes, sir. As a matter of fact, she could put this to use. Would you like to meet our first contestant for this evening? Mrs. Hazel Lee of Warburton Highway in Yarra Junction. Hello, Hazel. Hello, Hazel. How, How are you? Doing? Doing? Nice to meet oh, you. Nice. This is Don. Nice to meet you. Hazel's nervous. Don't be nervous. No need to be. Just take it nice and easy. What number would you like, Hazel? Number six. Number six. Okay. Around this way. We haven't given a car away since this man haven't. came up. Motorface Datsun. Tonight could be the night. Giuseppe Aliotti. Around this way and down that way, and good luck, Hazel. Big spin, Hazel. Oh, big spin. So many trips, don't we? I reckon there's no given time in any year when we haven't got somebody from the Don Lane Show travelling around Australia and about. Yes, that's true. That's right. This is a 16-day camping holiday. We may, we may holiday. be doing that. Uh, do you like? Uh, <laughs> do you like camping holiday? Uh, do you like camping? Uh, I've never tried. Well, you love it Bert because it's a most... loves it. It's his favourite pastime. It's it's a most unusual way to. Uh, well, it's it's a way of doing it which is different from you know having necessities and luxuries and things like that. <laughs> you travel with AAT, which is a marvellous coach, both of them. You travel with the latest range of non-tier Armalite travel goods from airport <laughs> luggage, the luggage that can really take it. You visit Ayers Rock, you visit Alice Springs, Cooper PD, wonderful hospital there, you'll have heat exhaustion there. And also then you go to the Vulgar Algas with Bill King's Australian Adventure Tours. And I'll tell you what, the 16-day camping holiday for two, including nights, from, well, of course, it would have to include nights, wouldn't it? I mean, they couldn't sure. send you home every evening. That's right. <laughs> Travelling with airport luggage, the value is $1,300. And I must say, in all sincerity, it is a wonderful, wonderful holiday. It certainly is. Wonderful, wonderful. It is. Oh, wonderful. Yes. It is wonderful, wonderful. What was the name of Adam and Eve's... Uh, never mind. <laughs> Complete... <laughs> Who is the genius for that question? Let's have a look. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me no, have no, a look. No. I'll tweet oh, afterwards. No, because I'll, you'll do something. I, won't, I promise I won't. No, you My word of honour. Okay. My word of honour. Okay. Which one? That one. That was the third one. Filthy. Yeah, right. <laughs> Absolutely disgraceful. Complete this old proverb. Make hay while... The sun shines. That's it. About that, isn't that good? All right. Enjoy your show. Nice to meet you, Hazel. All and the best now. Thank you. On Don's Wheel, a week for two at beautiful Wanderer's Paradise on Queensland's Wood Sunday Coast, flying with RTAA and no charge for your kids. You could win $600 worth of quality Nilex garden care products, including the Nilex Shade House Kit, which can be collected from your nearest Mitre 10 store, plus $600 cash from Nilex. And this luxurious Sabre Lounge Suite from Sabre Furniture Exhibition and Sales, Frankston Road, Dandenong. And you could win quality men's clothing to the value of $1,200 from Stafford Ellenson, the winning look. You'll be a winner too in the winning look from Stafford Ellenson. A great prize on Don's wheel. And right after this break, Don and Bert will be back to see Bootsy make a spectacle of himself performing I Only Have Eyes for You. Okay. I don't want to ask him, you ask him. 
What's that? Don't put it on me. You ask it. Well, we're, we're asked now to uh, to mention a concert that the, the Graham Lyle Band is appearing at. Uh, Graham, do you mind us occasionally building a show around these plugs for the Not orchestra? All, Bert. Uh, the, the, Graham, the Graham Lyle uh, Don Lane Show Band is appearing at the Melbourne Concert Hall on Wednesday, the 21st of uh, this month, which is uh, this coming Wednesday, yeah. And it's part of the celebrations uh, celebrating South Melbourne, the suburb of, of South Melbourne. It should be a very, 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 very wonderful show. It'll be a bang-up show with <coughs> all those guys. Frank String is the compere, would you believe? Is he real? He really is. Real. Julie McKenna is there. Michael right. Banjo Young is He's on the bill. He's wonderful. Michael Banjo Young. I had... He's fantastic. i got to tell you something funny about him. I had a, my, my mother's birthday party at the... I'm sorry, at the Walnut Tree. And Michael Banjo Young has a, has a restaurant down the street, came running in and said, I want to play for your mother's birthday, and proceeded to tear the whole restaurant to shreds. Well, you're yelling at him because he's... No, so no, you've got time for the story. What happened? It's okay, forget <laughs> it. Michael Banjo Young came in and played and tore the place apart. Well, he's a wonderful him. kid. Yeah. Do, do like that. We'll get back to him because he feels much better. I know what I'd love to do. But Butsy hasn't always... Butsy hasn't always been a pianist. At one stage, he was quite talented. Um, here at Channel 9, the management thinks so highly of Butsy that they've insured his hands for... <laughs> they think so highly of Butsy that they've insured his hands for $2.75. <laughs> You've heard of a uh, pianist playing by ear, Butsy plays by on the nose. Anyway, uh, we got... <laughs> Butsy is gonna play a little number for us. What's it called, Butsy? Call, call it out, mate. Butsy, you alive there? What's the song? What you playing? Only have eyes for you. I only... I only have eyes for you, said Bootsy. <laughs> Here's Bootsy. I can only give you love that lasts forever And the promise to be near each time you call And the only heart I own for you and you alone That's all, that's all We're almost on time, is that it? We're almost on time This is the closest we've ever come They'll be fainting upstairs Everybody will be so happy That we've finally got off the air on time I mean, we're as close to being on time As we have ever been You know what I mean? We can almost, we can almost finish on time now 
We're only about a minute behind finishing on time. You know what I mean? This will be terrific tonight. We'll have everything we want. You know what I mean? <laughs> on our next show, Los Trios Ring Barkus, winner of the comedy section in the Edinburgh Festival. We're going to cross to them live in Trafalgar Square in London to have a chat. And they're gonna do a routine there for us in the middle of Trafalgar Square. Should be a fun night, plus a lot of other things, okay? On behalf of Bertram, uh, Sir Bert, excuse me, myself, Butchie, Graham Lyle, the boys of the band, everybody that works here, we thank you for joining us tonight. Have a lovely time, we'll see you on Thursday. Good night, we love your faces. Take it easy, all right? We'll see you. Stay at Irvin Rockman's Regency Hotel in Melbourne.